My first question, and, and thank you all for being here live. That's, it's very nice to have a nice live audience uh, yeah. again uh, after so many, so many years, actually. <laughs> but uh, true. when you read your book, it doesn't sound like you're working in Contra Costa. You know, it sounds like you're working in New York City. Um, and that, I think, just shows what editing can do when you take uh, you know, a whole career and edit it down. Sure. Um, but uh, as we were chatting before, uh, there was a time when things were, when there was more serial killer, more serial rapists. Um, maybe you can talk about that. It was already before you started. You started in 1994, so they were already cold cases. Right. Uh, so why don't you just tell about that? Well, y y and what I would say is that, yes, the, the, this book covers my career. Now, these are only select cases in my career. Mm -hmm. I've worked many, many more that didn't make it into the book. And I ended up focusing in on serial predators in 1994. I started with the sheriff's office as a civilian forensic scientist in 1990, and then got fascinated with uh, cold cases, and in particular, uh, cases that appeared to be predatory, or fantasy-motivated homicides. and. Um, I started focusing in on those in 1994, with the first one being what was known at the time as the East Area Rapist. But as I compiled lists of unsolved cases in Contra Costa County, it became, you know, I was stunned in terms of the, the, the number of these cases. And then as I started working these cases, started to identify these serial killers, Phil Hughes, Charles Jackson, Daryl Kemp, um, and it, it was just stunning, especially when you consider where these cases were occurring, which mm -hmm. was in, uh, you know, Arenda, Lafayette, Moraga, Walnut Creek. You know, you have very what were considered very safe neighborhoods, but you have multiple serial killers working in those neighborhoods at the same time. In fact, there's a, a, a neighborhood. Uh, San Marcos Estates in Walnut Creek that I call the Bermuda Triangle of serial killers because mm. I've got th I've got uh, three serial killers that attacked one being Joseph D'Angelo in that very neighborhood off of Ignacio Valley across from Heather Farms and then we've got another unsolved case a 1976 case of little Lisa Dickinson young girl who went to ride her bike and is still missing to this day mm. Speaking of missing to this day, let's go to the missing to this day, not, well, she's not missing anymore, uh, case, um, J.C. Dugard, yeah. that you talk about, because th that's a fascinating case. It reminded me of, of um, the uh, woman up in, uh, in Utah, in uh, Salt Lake City, that was uh, uh, taken by a guy and had to be his oh, wife. Yes, I know, I know which case you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, who, who now goes out and speaks about it yes. um, and uh, is doing a great job, I think, of trying to explain how to deal with having to face somebody that's going to either rape you or kill you. Right. Um, and how do you deal with that mentally? And we'll get back to that. But well, this J.C. Dugard uh, case is a woman disappeared as, um, as an 11-year-old girl from, from uh, South Lake Tahoe and showed up in Contra Costa 21 years later. Why don't you tell the story about how she was living? Because it's kind of strange. Well, it's, it, you know, this is just, this was stunning to us. Um, when, when it actually came to light that this, this missing girl out of the Tahoe area it was living now as a mom with her abductor um, against her will. Uh, but, you know, sort of like, well, how, you know, how did we miss this? You know, that, that's where you go, oh, what's, what's going on here? And, and, you know, she had been out uh, up in the Tahoe area uh, riding her bike, and it, and it comes out that Phil Garrido and his wife Nancy saw her Phil Garrido is a predator, um, and uh, Nancy, the wife, was the one that went out, lured J.C. close to the car, and used a stun gun on J.C. in order to get her into the car, and then they drove all the way down to the Antioch area, and then basically J.C., who was chained inside the shed for years, became Phil Garrido's sex slave. And then ultimately, this young woman, young girl, uh, you know, uh, gives birth to two of Phil Garrido's kids, two daughters. Um, and then eventually what ended up happening is, is Phil Garrido had a 
kind of an interesting, almost cult-like, like a David Koresh type of mentality. And he really was uh, trying to preach, in his mind, the Word of God. And there, he's out in Berkeley with his two daughters um, and two female cops out in Berkeley were like, this doesn't look right. And they went up and they talked to him. And uh, they, they got hinked up about him, but they kicked him off the campus. And then further digging, he ends up being found to be on parole. His parole agent was out of Concord. And now, you know, there's the parole agent is call, calling Phil in and then calling, you know, what, who ultimately was J.C., uh, but she didn't identify herself as J.C. Dugard until eventually it was. But, you know, at this point, uh, you know, she had almost completely forgotten her prior life. And she had told Garrido, I will stay with you as long as you don't touch my daughters like you touched me. Mm. Um, and so at this point, you know, that's where everything descends on Phil Garrido. El Dorado County FBI come and they do their search for the J.C. Dugard case in proper. And I'm sitting in my office in Martinez. I'm going, what is going on? And so now I'm digging into Phil Garrido. And then I see Phil Garrido, you know, basically at a Pittsburgh council meeting, meeting giving a, a, almost a character witness statement to this uh, Jimmy Molina who, who owned JM Enterprises, which was a junkyard. Mm -hmm. And this is where we have a kind of, a, it's almost like a central location to an unsolved series of women who have been killed out in that area. And it's like, what's the possibility that Garrido is involved in this series? And I write about this series in the book. And so myself, my homicide uh, bud from Pittsburgh, and then a DA who has since passed away, Bob Hole, no relationship, relationship to me at least recent. <laughs> we might be related about 500 years ago out in England, but we haven't quite. But, you know, uh, we figured out how to draft a search warrant to search Garrido's property. And so now we're searching Garrido's property to see if he had any role in the unsolved uh, series out in Pittsburgh, which included a 15-year-old girl, Lisa Norell. And as we're doing this, then Alameda County gets interested in Phil Garrido uh, for the Eileen Mischeloff and uh, Michaela Garrett cases, two missing girls who are still missing to this day. And so we end up literally, I spent two weeks there on that property and we bulldozed everything on this property, but it was so amazing to see how JC, not only how she had been kept, as a basically a, a young child sex slave and then when she's raising her children you know this it was literally a junkyard you know you have abandoned cars you had to sh you know uh sheds that are falling apart uh tents that are sent up they would use holes in the ground as toilets um, and you're going, you know, these, these poor girls, how could they be raised? You know, I'm so concerned when my kids were young, you know, though that electrical outlet doesn't have a safety plug in it, right? And yet these, these girls, you know, were raised up and they, they, they actually thrived. You know, they, they did okay. JC did an amazing job, you know, and, and fortunately, you know, she, she got her life back. Mm -hmm. But it just, uh, I mean, just absolutely tragic in terms of thinking, you know, hear this man for his own, and, and really Nancy for his own, their own personal needs. You know, they, um, you know, they took a part of this this woman's life, JC's life away. Yeah, uh, we will talk a little bit more about the psychology of of um, these people and and how to deal with them uh, a little bit later. And uh, if you have any questions, as uh, he mentioned, uh, you know, especially if you're watching this as a live stream, you can also send it in by YouTube. Uh, on the chat room. Um, we'd be happy to answer questions a little bit later. Before we go into some of the other cases that you did, uh, I thought it was a very interesting part of your book that you talked about your, your partners, the two policemen, Kanadi and... and uh, Kanadi and Giacomelli. And, uh, yeah. uh, and, and how you weren't really a policeman, but they kind of pulled you into the process because you were coming into the process by yourself. I just tell this story because it's, it's uh, you know, it's part of the camaraderie of working something that's really, really difficult to work. No, well, absolutely, you know, and, and um, you know, so John Kennedy and Ray Giacomelli were two partners out of Pittsburgh PD. I first met them on the Lisa Norell case. 
And, you know, as we got to know each other, uh, they, they were like the true buddy cops that you see, like Lethal Weapon, Mel Gibson and Danny Glover. You know, it was like a, a brother relationship. They were very experienced homicide investigators, very good at what they did. Uh, and, but they, you know, they had a kind of a, you know, a side to them, you know, a street side to them as, as well. And I just happened to really relate to them. And I was getting into, you know, at this point, I was about four years into my cold case thing, but it was mostly from the lab. But then I was so interested in the investigative side. And so they would come in and we would chat, you know, we'd roll around together. You know, they're kind of talking to me as, as we're, we're going out to this one homicide scene that I needed to reconstruct. And then, of course, I'm meeting them out in the field for a variety of additional homicides that were occurring after I first met them. You know, and, and then there's a story where we're coming back from this one case that I was tasked with doing a reconstruction on out there in uh, Bay Point. Um, and uh, Connady's driving and Ray is in the front passenger seat. And these guys at that time, they would have, you know, thousand plus dollar suits on and have the sunglasses on and they look so cool. And here I am just sort of like this, this young, you know, lab geek that was in their car. Mm -hmm. And I see Connady's head whip around. And then next thing you know, he's doing a U-turn on Willow Pass Road and he <laughs> goes up and there's this woman that's on the nods. You know, she's a, she's a sex worker in the area and Ray rolls down his window and and she knows exactly who they are right and ray goes hey and i can't remember her name hey have you have you run across a paul holes before and she says, what <laughs> paul holes have you run across him paul holes no well keep a watch out we want to know if you run across him <laughs> And then, you know, I'm like slinking back in my seat because now my name is out on the street as some John that Pittsburgh PD is looking for. Uh, you know, so that, that was the type of uh, relationship that we had. And, you know, the book uh, outlines, you know, what happened to Ray, which was absolutely tragic. And, yeah. and uh, you know, uh, the Kennedy and I are, are still buds to this day. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was just... That's just part of, you know, there's almost like an apprenticeship aspect. You know, of course, I'm a, I'm a scientist initially, and then I got into the investigative role. But then I also played sports, you know, and you get into that camaraderie. Uh, and, and that really was a, you know, and is a, a true friendship. Uh, but I owe them so much. And so I, I, I dedicated a chapter to Kennedy and Giacomelli and, 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 and telling that story. It just happened that when Ray got killed, um, I was also dealing with the Lacey Peterson case. And so it was a very high stress time and very emotionally draining time when I'm kind of juggling both sides of that. What I thought was fascinating about what you wrote uh, was it, it helped explain sort of the dark humor situation in the, in the, with, with the corpses in the room and coming on the slab and having to investigate all this and all of the difficult emotional things. You go to a crime scene, you know, the things you see at the crime scene you have to deal with emotionally. And there's endless TV shows about this now. Um, and I think some people find it entertaining it's like that, but they don't realize as much maybe that this is a coping mechanism as you said well no no it very much is uh, it, and that's where you know when it, as an example uh, again with with Kennedy and Giacomelli you know we were in the autopsy room on one of these cases and Giacomelli was saying to the pathologist I don't ever want to be autopsied and the pathologist says, oh, don't worry, you won't feel a thing. <laughs> and then Ray's response says, well, I'm going to swallow a capsule. So if you open me up, it's going to have a little note inside that capsule said, I told you not to autopsy. <laughs> right? Later on, that pathologist is the one that autopsied Ray. Hmm. So that's part of, you know, here you have the levity. Mm-hmm but then you also have the tragedy. And, and that's, that's part of what this book is about is, you know, the, the, the cases are fascinating that I write about, but it's also, you know, this is, this is real crime. 
You know, we're, we're in the true crime genre. I very much am in the true crime genre, but this is based on real crime. And, you know, now you're running into the, the psychological and emotional trauma that myself and other professionals experience as we go through these careers, you know, and that ultimately became one of my primary messages is to help people, whether you're somebody who has never worked in this field and are just interested in true crime, or you're a professional in the field and you are experiencing, you know, these, 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 uh, this trauma and you don't recognize it. And I'm trying to kind of put a light on it because I didn't recognize it until after I retired. After the success of D'Angelo and Golden State Killer, mm. you know, now I'm all of a sudden as a, you know, 50 plus year old man. <laughs> now I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all of a sudden I'm recognizing, you know, the, you know this, this career came with some sacrifices. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, it's useful to know that prison guards uh, not just soldiers in war, but prison guards also are having to deal with the situation all the time. And, and, you know, part of our prison problem is, you know, we ask people to be prison guards and, mm -hmm. and, and live their life in that circumstance. So uh, not just the police. There's so many different roles in society where we ask people to do something to help protect us. And it comes at a cost. Uh, well, very much so. And just within law enforcement, you think about it, of course, homicide investigators well, what about the CSIs, mm -hmm. the death investigators, the dispatchers? You know, everybody, it's, it's different. It's a spectrum, but there's, there's levels of trauma. And if you are doing it over and over and over again, I've been working these types of cases for close to 30 years now, and it's had an impact on me, and it's had an impact on others. In fact, you know, my... I, I just, in fact, when I was up in Portland, I flew out of Portland this morning, by the way, to you know, be able to get down here for these, these events. And I was interviewed last night by a podcast crew called Small Town Dicks, Yardley Smith and Dan and Dave. And Dan and Dave are law enforcement officers or, or recently left law enforcement. And Dave, who spent much of his career as an investigator working child abuse cases, um, he read my prologue mm -hmm. uh, in the book and as soon as he stopped reading that prologue, he texted me saying, that hit me hard. I so relate. And that was my validation in terms of, okay, I did the right thing by exposing myself and my struggles for somebody like Dave and others out there to go, oh, I need to maybe consider, you know, I, I'm not just going to bury myself, you know, in the bottle. And I very much thank <laughs> the Commonwealth <laughs> Club for bringing the bottle up. Uh, but, you know, whether it be, you know, in relationships, withdrawing from a relationship or detaching from just normal activities, you know, that's something that is part of this trauma. And, uh, you know, that, so that's where, you know, this message is something I'm really trying to get out and say it's okay, you know, go seek help because in law enforcement, it's very much, you know, alpha male, testosterone driven. If you show weakness, you know, you are going to be razzed. I mean, you're going to be ostracized. You will be passed over for promotion. You know, so you really have to kind of put on a facade and bury some of the struggles you might be having. And uh, now we just need to get that culture to change in, in order to make sure the people that are doing this job are, are getting, you know, a level of help so that their quality of life is not impacted and that will make them better in their professional life as well yeah and i think that's a crucial part that that by doing it that way they're going to be better at their job yes a little bit more um so gruesome details um that cause this kind of trauma you mentioned one case um the bodfish case where you thought that the corpse who had been dead for several days mm -hmm. was moving um, didn't turn out to be moving though by itself. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and this is, you know, this is, a, I mean, it's a fascinating case, fascinating crime scene because it was so surreal. Uh, Emin Bodfish had been bludgeoned in his home in Orinda. Uh, actually, kind of, <laughs> you have an association with that. Uh, yep. Yep, you know it well. And. Yeah, as I'm walking to through the garage door, you know, uh, I'm, I'm walking past a Bentley, 
And I was like, wow, that's the first time I've seen a Bentley uh, at a crime scene. And, and I hear this buzzing. And initially, I think it's an electrical buzzing. And as soon as I open the garage door leading into the kitchen, the buzzing all of a sudden gets very loud. It's like, oh, this isn't good. And as I go around the corner, I am now trying to fight my way through swarms of flies. And now here's the victim lying on his back. Uh, head has been crushed in and has been dead for about five days and happened to be a time in Orinda where... Um, you know, it had been 100 plus degree temperatures for most of that time. And of course, insect activity increases as temperature increases. And all this movement that I thought was going on on this victim's body, particularly where the injuries were, turned out to be maggots, fly maggots. And I literally have flies bumping into me as they're flying around and swarming. Um, but that fly evidence turned out to be absolutely critical. And the, the fascinating aspect about this case is when I'm processing the victim's head, there were two different size larvae. There was this larger white larva, and then there was these tiny little gray larvae that were also present. And of course, being diligent, I collect both. And then using an entomologist, who is very familiar with the, the fly population in the Orinda Hills, um, he ended up identifying the two different types of flies. And he said, well, what, the, the larger fly larvae were, were about five days old, which would be consistent at the time of death. Mm -hmm. But he says, well, the unusual thing is, is that the tiny gray ones were only two days old. And flies will land on a body within minutes after death. I've seen it happen and start pumping their eggs and orifices and open wounds and everything else. It's just, you know, fascinating uh, kind of life cycle. Um, and so, but the entomologist said, well, you know, I usually see this when, you know, the first responders come in and it just smells so bad and they want fresh air that they start opening up windows and everything else. And then I started looking into this. Well, when we arrived at that scene, there was a door open and there was a broken window that had been left open. The larger fly larvae were kind of, it was a, 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 a bottle blue brush fly. It was just a common house fly that would have been present in any house and would have landed on Emmons body within minutes and deposit, deposit its larvae. But the other fly is not a house fly. It is, does not go inside the house unless, unless there's a reason to, like there's a, there's a dead body in there. Mm. And so this fly waited for three days before depositing its eggs on Emmons' body. Well, why did it do that if it had free access with the open door and the open window? Mm. Well, that fly evidence meant that, nope, that didn't happen. That, that window and that door were closed, preventing that type of fly, outdoor fly, from coming in, depositing its eggs. So now this suggested a secondary intrusion. Emmon was killed. The house was left closed for three days. And then the house was opened up. And this allowed the outdoor fly to come in and deposit the eggs two days prior to us finding Emmon's body. Well, why would that be happening? Well, turns out that Emmon was a third order priestess in the Druid religion. And part of her diaries, 17 years of her diaries that I read, you know, she needed to be reincarnated to escape this inner demon that she had called the blue demon conscience. And she needed to die a, um, a uh, violent death. And I should probably say, you know, Emmon was born Margaret. And then as Margaret aged, ended up living the life of a man, adopting the name as Emmon. And now he is saying, I have to get out of this life and escape this demon. I'm reading Starhawk's book, Pagan, the, 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 pagan uh, Living and Dying, you know, the, the Art of the Pagan Way of Living and Dying. I forget the exact title. But in there, there is a, a, a aspect where if somebody dies within, let's say, a residence, you don't want to disturb that residence for three days because the soul will get confused and will not be able to go on to their next life or reincarnation. There was a yellow liquid poured on Emmons' chest in a ritual. So this is a clue 
as to who possibly killed Ammon. And quite frankly, this case is likely an assisted suicide, even though Ammon was bludgeoned to death. But whoever did it needs to be caught because it's a special person who's willing to come in and use something like a baseball bat to crush somebody's head in. And based on the crime scene reconstruction, there were two people there. And there was artwork stolen. Painting was stolen. And I believe the back of that painting possibly contained Swiss bank account information that was the reward for them coming and doing what Emin wanted to do, is to die a violent, sudden death so she could leave the blue demon conscious behind. Could you make this up in a... <laughs> right? No. no. Truth, no. Real, yeah, real crime is stranger than fiction. Did you... People in, in the police department or whatever kind of assumed it was the uh, uh, stepson or the son, the son that, that then committed suicide two days later or yes. something like that. But you think it was somebody who was a member of this Druid group. Did any of the members of that Druid group that he belonged to uh, disappear? No. So um, I believe Emin utilized connections through the pagan community, not necessarily the Druid community, in mm -hmm. order to be able to reach out and arrange to have individuals who are willing to bludgeon somebody to death to yeah. commit that crime. Now, her son did commit suicide down in Santa Monica, and this has been a debate between myself and two other investigators on the case where they're absolutely convinced the son is responsible. Well, I read 10 years of the son's diaries, and every day he was like, uh, you know, I'm going to, uh, today's the day I'm going to kill myself. And then, well, mom's still around, you know, blah, blah, blah. Now, m mom has been killed. If he's the one responsible, I believe it would have been a murder-suicide. He would have mm -hmm. killed himself right then and there. But most importantly is that the crime scene reconstruction showed there were two people beating on Emmett. So if the son was one of them, there's still somebody out there yeah. that was involved in this homicide. It, when, when did this take place? Oh, geez, 1999, okay. June 1999. Okay. So, <laughs> but that's, so that's unsolved in your opinion? I think it's absolutely unsolved, yeah. and I think there are people out there who know. Yeah. All right. Well, let's switch to at least one more before we got well, two more. Before okay. We, before we get to the Golden State Killer, and that's what everybody's asking about. <laughs> so we'll, you know, we will use the dramatic buildup uh, to get to him. Um, so there was a case uh, of uh, a couple who were building their dream home, and uh, the n teenage neighbor uh, took the yes. life for the wife. Yeah. Yeah. Pa Pamela Vitali. Uh, she was a uh, a woman. Um, married to actually a, a fairly well-known uh, attorney who also appears on, on the media. He was appearing on the media mm -hmm. as well as practicing uh, uh, defense work uh, in the Bay Area. And they were building a very large house, um, and I think it's called Runsacker Canyon in the Lafayette area. Kind of a nice, nice area, very kind of rural. And that the big for lack of a better word, mansion that they were building, um, was still under construction, and they were living in this uh, mobile trailer, and that's where she's found bludgeoned to death. Um, and I didn't go out to the original, on the original response. I was a supervisor at the time. One of my staff, a couple of my staff had gone out initially, and then I went out to kind of take a look when there were some questions about uh, you know how much more latent processing that needed to be done inside this crime scene. And what struck me as I was looking at this crime scene and looking at the crime scene photos was the struggle that this woman put up. And part of assessing a crime scene, you know, when, when it is now one-on-one -on -one combat, is trying to assess, is there a something I can discern that gives me some idea about the difference in the physical characteristics of the offender versus the victim. And this victim was not a small woman, but she wasn't a huge woman. Her, you know, she wasn't into MMA or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and she was able to hold off 
this this offender for a long time where this this offender really struggled to get her under control there you know a lot of blood staining throughout this uh, family room area inside the mobile home trailer a lot of furniture that's been turned over other objects that have been moved out of place during the struggle and then eventually the offender got the upper hand uh, and then was able to to bludgeon her to death but i talked to the assigned investigator on the case outside of that house and i said you know this is not indicative of very what, what we would call a robust male a very big strong guy you know, a very big, strong guy and somebody's Pamela's size, you know, this would be a very contained crime scene because as soon as this guy gets his hands on her, she's not going anywhere. She's down. Um, but this was a very prolonged struggle. And so I told him, this is not a very big guy. And uh, turned out to be a skinny 17-year-old boy, Scott Dulesky. Uh, and, you know, part of what I also assessed was is that, you know, she had this uh, sock that near the toes, you know, where oftentimes it wears, you know, her foot had kind of blown through that sock. And it was like, you know, she's kicking at this guy. Mm -hmm. You know, if she hit him in the mouth or the nose, you know, is it possible that his DNA could be there? So that was swabbed. And that's the one location at the crime scene and off the victim's body that Dulesky's DNA was found. And then eventually, investigators find a car out on the Dulesky property or near adjacent property. And it's got, you know, his kind of equipment, clothing and stuff that he had used to get into this house. And it has Vitaly's blood on it. You know, it was really kind of a slam dunk case. But now people are saying he's not responsible and it's like no mm -hmm. you know this this is uh this is as easy as it gets um but he took the time to carve a symbol in the victim's back so this is more sinister than just somebody who the prosecutor's theory was he went into that house because he had marijuana grow equipment delivered there as opposed to his parents house and then it, things went sideways it's like no you know He's got some fantasy going on. In fact, he had a, a book on serial predators inside his bedroom. So I think Dulesky potentially has uh, an aspect to him that if he had stayed out in the public domain, that maybe he would have reoffended. Yeah. One of the other things that that case, uh, that you're, you're paid attention to this sock, and you could tell that maybe that should be checked, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and, and that proved to be the, where it came from is the diligence uh, and scientific approach to evidence and to trying to prove a case that shows in all of your work. Um, and I think it's a really important thing in, in, in general in our society because if we just go by intuition um, or a, a couple pieces of information and then an intuition, um, I think that's where we make a lot of errors um, yep. and, and another part of the tragedy that we have in our society with all this violent crime is also uh, accusing somebody that looks like they're the one and absolutely and, and so this this is you know and i've learned this the hard way uh you know and i i detail as i talk about the golden state killer in this case where you know i had numerous individuals that i thought was a guy you know this is a guy i'm looking for and i spent two years on this one suspect who had been contacted back in the day um, and this absolutely amazing uh, overlap with, at the time, was known as the East Area Rapist Geographic Connections, you know, proximities and suspicious behaviors. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking as I'm reading what this guy was about, it's like, you know, this guy, this, this can't be coincidence. You know, the, the circumstance, the circumstantial evidence must show that he is the guy. And so I ended up spending two years looking for him because he dropped off the face of the earth back in 2004, right around the time when Prop 69, which opened up California's DNA databases to be, have more people sampled, almost as if he were trying to hide from the ability, you know, from getting his DNA up into the system. And, you know, eventually uh, we catch up to him um, and I detail how that happens in the book. And eliminate him. And I was like, how could he not be 
the East Area Rapist, aka the Golden State Killer. And, and that's when I stepped back. And, and this is where, you know, I ended up reading a, an article by Dr. Kim Rosmo, and he had written an article on criminal investigative failures. You know, and this is where you get into deductive versus inductive reasoning and uh, where, where we fail as investigators, and this is what I did in this particular case, is I found a guy and I tried to make the case fit him. And so I'm looking at all of the details and it's all circumstantial. I'm going, yes, 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 this must be him. And then those details where it didn't quite add up, I was like, man, okay, I'll excuse that away. Um, versus letting the evidence lead me to somebody. And that's really what Rosmo is, is trying to convey to investigators is, you know, if you have objective evidence, you need to rely upon that objective evidence in order to develop your suspects. Don't pick somebody out and try to make the case fit. And that is what we were doing with Golden State Killer. We had a master name index of over 8,000 names. And, you know, you start going, okay, well, this, 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 and this adds up about this guy. You know, but fundamentally, it's the DNA. It's that objective evidence. You know, so once I kind of stepped back, reassessed, and moved forward, then I recognized, okay, I've got really two pieces of evidence that I thought would solve the case. One was the DNA, which at that point in time, I had done everything possible um, in, what was that, 2012, 2011, 2012 timeframe. And then I had this homework evidence that I believed the East Area Rapists had dropped. And one was this very unique hand-drawn map. And I was like, that's unique enough. Somebody's going to recognize it. And I really dug in to, to that evidence. And after D'Angelo was identified, I don't even know if it's even related to the case at this point. But this is where you, you see this tragedy, and it's not necessary, necessarily uh, purposeful or negligent on investigator and prosecutor's part, but it's that you know, we as humans really don't have the mental capacity to assess coincidence. Mm -hmm. So we think there's no way that can be coincidence. Well, what does that actually mean? Right, and, and when you have multiple things that uh, you go, wow, this adds up to the case, and that's no way that can be coincidence. And then you have the objective evidence like DNA where it goes, well, guess what? That was coincidence. Mm -hmm. And so the experience that I've had, when you cast a wide enough net, like in the Golden State Killer case or like in Zodiac, you will find multiple people in which you can build a circumstantial case where you will be convinced and when, you, when I hear, you know, uh, investigators say, I don't believe in coincidences, they're wrong. It <laughs> happens. <laughs> and and that, that was a tough lesson to learn. But then we, we yeah. talk about these, these poor men and women that have been falsely convicted and their lives have been stripped away by the government, you know, sometimes many decades being spent in, in, in prison. And I'm sure there's so many more. And it's because it's based on circumstances and god forbid that you also have purposeful you know i want to just solve this case and, and move on and this guy is going to be the fall guy you know that's criminal you know and, and for me the biggest fear that i have in my career is that i've done something either forensically or investigatively that has put the wrong person in prison and i sure hope that that never happened because to me that's almost a bigger tragedy than allowing a case go unsolved. One other tangential you know, movement before we get right back into the Golden State Killer, um, and that's uh, Lacey and Connor uh, mm -hmm. Peterson case. And, and what was your um, experience with that? Well, that was, you know, that was a case that was out of Modesto, Stanislaw yeah. County. You know, so I saw the headlines, and it was a big case. Um, but I just saw the headlines. I was not familiar with the case hardly at all. And then Lacey and Connor washed up on the shores of Contra Costa County. Mm -hmm. So now I, at this point, was a supervisor over the criminalistics unit with the Sheriff's Office Crime Lab, and I assigned a criminalist that I was very um, confident would do a great job 
processing Lacey's body and the evidence that came up with her body. But I also went out to the morgue in order to be able to see what was going on with Lacey. And then Richmond PD's CSI was handling Connor's body. Um, and there was much less physical evidence on, on that body that, that we had to deal with. And, you know, bodies that have been submerged in a marine environment for a period of time really do change dramatically. And, I, and I'm not going to describe in detail anything about either one of Thank the you. bodies. Um, but the part of what was I really glommed onto with, with Lacey was the amount of what I'd call sessile organisms on her body. You know, now you get, not only do you have predation, uh, by the, the, the marine organisms on a human body. But you also can have, just like a ship, can have barnacles growing on mm -hmm. it, right? And so I'm looking at these various organiz organisms going, I wonder if this can be used like insect de evidence in order mm -hmm. to determine an approximate, you know, date of death, time of death. Um, and so I start researching that. And I, I don't make much progress on that front, reaching out to experts. But one of the experts that I had used previously was an anthropologist out of UC Santa Cruz. And this was on a 1969 uh, missing girl case, Elaine Davis, out of Walnut Creek, who uh, just disappeared. And, and ultimately, we identified her as a Jane Doe that had washed up in Santa Cruz two weeks after she went missing in Walnut Creek. So obviously, the offender abducted her and, 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 and took her down. And I don't talk about that particular case in this book. But because of that case, I was familiar with Dr. Allison Galloway. So I'm talking to the coroner's office. I call up uh, Dr. Galloway and say, hey, this is, uh, we need you up here, you know, because we, we now have, you know, very um, decomposed remains that have been in a marine environment. And her specialty, because she was at University of Santa Cruz, they have all sorts of humans washing up on their shore. So if you ever go down to Santa Cruz, just kind of <laughs> keep your eyes peeled. Um, so, so we get doc, I get Dr. Allison Galloway to commit to coming up. And, and then this is where this case uh, intersects with my relationship with John Connedy and Ray Giacomelli. And I'm in the morgue the next day after Ray is killed. And I'm uh, dealing with Lacey and Connor Peterson. And uh, Dr. Galloway's doing her thing. And then I get called in to the, the other room of the morgue where Ray has been wheeled out because the, patho the uh, DA, Bob Hole, wanted my expertise. So this man who I knew well whose hand I sh just shook the next day is now laying on the morgue table in the very room where he's telling the pathologist, I don't ever want to be autopsied. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is where it gets dark, right? Um, and so i dealing with Ray, and then I have to go back and, and deal with Lacey and Connor. Um, and Dr. Galloway ends up you know, being able to formulate an opinion based on the uh, Connors gestational age, be based on the bone structure, you know, as, as the fetus is going through different phases, you know, the bones, of course, form at these different phases. And one of the defense arguments in that case was, is that, well, Lacey had been abducted and held alive for a period of time, and therefore it couldn't be Scott Peterson. Yet Dr. Galloway was able to show that Connor stopped developing at the time Lacey was reported missing. And then eventually Connor ended up, because Lacey's abdomen decomposed, separating from her body in the bay. And that, that's why they washed up separately. There was no birth aspect. There was nothing like that. And so that became critical testimony in the case against Scott Peterson. But I didn't even, I wasn't even engaged with the Peterson case because of what happened to Ray. You know, it was just like, okay, I, I did my duty mm -hmm. and I, I think I could have contributed to the Peterson case if I didn't have this, this, this personal tragedy that happened at the same time. Yeah, it was extremely sad because uh, his partner, his mother had just died and that was why yes. they weren't together. So all three of those things happened. Yeah, and, and, and so I lay out exactly, you know, you know how this whole tra this 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 thing transpired, and 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 if you're interested, Condity and Giacomelli's story is uh, I, th I think the the show is called Blood Brothers, 
and I forget what network it's on, but if you wanted to see you know, a little bit more about the details of, of the case, um, it, it would be in, in, in that particular TV show. All right, so let's get to the Golden State Killer, um, known here in the Contra Costa area as the East Area Rapist, right? And uh, you had looked at that as a cold case that you were looking into, um, and it looked to you and maybe to others as if he was progressing in a way which would have led to being a murderer. Yes. Um, and so then you made a connection. You, you did this over 20 years, all the different pieces of this, or something like that, right? Well, I started on the case in 1994. Mm -hmm. In 1997, I finally got DNA, and that's when I initially did a somewhat of a telephonic investigation that led me to Orange County. But we had incompatible DNA profiles. Uh, I was using an old dot blot method, uh, DQ alpha polymarker. Orange County was using this newfangled short tandem repeat or STR, which the current FBI's uh, CODIS system is built upon. But when I had contacted Orange County's analyst back in 97, she had at least done DQ alpha. And you know, my DQ alpha two, two comma three and her DQ alpha two comma three were the same, but it's like having the same ABO blood type, you know, type A. And it's like, okay, that doesn't mean anything. And so I said, well, once we get caught up with you and, and the, the newfangled te technology, I'll be back in touch. And that took four years. Mm -hmm. And in 2001, I now had promoted by us, but I assigned a, a DNA analyst, let's redo this East Area Rapist DNA and the new technology which he did, and, and then he said, hey, you know, the three cases, you know, in Contra Costa County that we still had evidence on, they all match, same guy, and so that showed that the original investigators were right based on MO linking right. the cases. Also, uh, yeah, at that point, I just said, hey, call Mary, Mary Hong up in Orange County Sheriff's Crime Lab, um, and let's just check the box. That's what I was just thinking, mm -hmm. and he comes back and basically tells me, it's the same guy. And now it's like, boom, you know, here we have 50 attacks in Northern California between 1976 and 1979 by the East Area Rapist being linked to 10 homicides, six cases with 10 victims down in Southern California. And so now this is no longer just a, well, a hobby because Northern California at the time, we didn't think we could even, even if I identified the East Area Rapist, we, it was past statute of limitations, but now they had homicides. Um, so I really just pushed away at that point, you know, and, and that was 2001. Um, and I was now working Pittsburgh cases. I was working all these other cases. I was promoting up through the ranks. And then eventually, when I am now chief of forensics and I'm bored out of my skull, <laughs> I'm looking at my East Area Rapist files, which I had kept with me all along, I was like, that case is still not solved. And that's when I re-engaged. And then at that point, I was 24-7, 365, working the East Air Rapist case. And then eventually, you know, that's how I met Michelle McNamara, and we became uh, friends, investigative partners. She renamed the guy Golden State Killer, which I argued with her. I was like, <laughs> Come on, why do we need to do that? Um, and then she tragically passed away, and I do have a chapter devoted to, to Michelle. Um, and then ultimately, you know, you, using the genealogy tool, we were able to identify D'Angelo, Joseph D'Angelo, as the Golden State Killer right when I retired, or actually right after I retired, technically. One of the questions from the audience is, uh, why did uh, the GSK killer go to Southern California? Don't know. Um, you know, he hasn't talked. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> no, you know, it, it's one. It, it, so you, you think about D'Angelo. What, what we do know is D'Angelo is arrested by Sacramento uh, Sheriff's Office in July for shoplifting, dog repelling a hammer. He's put on um, admin leave as they're doing their IA investigation. And then in August, the chief decides to fire him. Um, he ends up, the first attack in Santa Barbara, in Galita, Santa Barbara, which goes sideways, he doesn't kill the couple or, or even sexually assault the woman, uh, is in October of 79. So he's being terminated in August. 
in October of 79, he's attacking down in Santa Barbara area. And then I believe it was later that month, he's up in court in Sacramento being convicted of the shoplifting charge. And then two months later, he does his first double homicide down in Goleta, just a few blocks south of where that initial attack occurred. So he is literally toggling back and forth between Sacramento and Santa Barbara during this time. And we don't know why he's going down to Santa Barbara. Uh, you know, was that a vacation spot? Was that a fishing spot? Because he's a big fisher. Uh, and so to this day, some of these attacks in Southern Cal, the location of these attacks in Southern California, we have no idea. He ends up relocating down to Long Beach. And this is one of the, the interesting things. Even before we had solved the case, it was like, well, he's in Santa Barbara, Ventura, and Orange County. But how come we don't have anything in Los Angeles? Is it just because they have so many cases we've overlooked it? And so I actually reached out to their cold case people saying, send me everything you have between these years that are unsolved, and I'm going to kind of scan them to see if, if anything stands out as potentially a Golden State killer case. And nothing did. Um, so, you know, until he talks or till his now ex-wife talks, I don't think we will know uh, what exactly he was doing down and why in those particular areas he was attacking. Mm -hmm. How do you think, there's another question from the audience, how do you think D'Angelo was able to not reoffend between the 1980s and his day of capture? How could he cope with not killing for so long? Ah, so this, this idea that a serial killer, once they start, they don't stop is a myth. And the FBI's behavioral analysts have flat out said that now that more of these serial killing cases have been solved and they're studying those. And I had been saying this even before then, when you take a look at Gary Ridgway, he killed 48 women, 1982-1984 up there in Seattle as a Green River killer, or Dennis Rader as BTK. Uh, they stopped when Gary Ridgway was being interviewed you know, and, and what happened? Why did he stop? I mean, he just, I mean, I, I've watched the interview with Mary Ellen O'Toole, who's an mm -hmm. FBI profiler, and he goes, oh, I got married. <laughs> but it's a life change. Maybe the marriage restricted his ability to go out. Maybe it calmed him down from certain stressors he was having. Who knows? Uh, Dennis Rader, who I think is the most similar uh, a, a predator to Joseph D'Angelo because he's very intelligent, very sophisticated. He would plan his crimes. And he, in his interview, said, I went into my last attack thinking after exhaustive surveillance and everything that he would do, all this planning, thinking there would just be my female victim inside the house. And there was a male inside the house when he went in. He got into a physical fight with the male. And, and Dennis Rader said, I walked out of that house thinking I could have been hurt, I could have been killed, I could have been caught, I don't want any of that to happen, I'm getting older, I can no longer do this, done. And the fantasy doesn't stop, but they are now in that self-preservation mode. And so when you think about D'Angelo, D'Angelo in his last attack in 1986 was 41 years old. And quite frankly, five years ago, he had been in a physical fight with six foot three Gary Sanchez out in Santa Barbara. And I won't go into too much detail about what happened, but he had to repeatedly go back to Sanchez after he had, been he had shot Sanchez through the left cheek, out the, the back of the head, but it was a non-fatal wound. And then he had to keep going back and fighting him. And there's obviously face-to-face um, -face combat with the types of lacerations on Gregory Sanchez's face. And you could see the panic by the Golden State Killer, the way that he is literally throwing the pre-tied bindings that he'd bring to scenes out as he's running out the side back door of this house. And it's like, I go, you know what? I bet D'Angelo, I'm sure D'Angelo probably was hurt. And then he also thought I could have been killed. I could have been caught. I don't want that to happen, just like Raider. And so he doesn't attack for five years until he, for some reason, beautiful 19-year-old Janelle Cruz, in May of 1986, he runs across and bludgeons her to death. And I just think he couldn't help himself. Um, and uh, the important thing was there was no male present in that case. So I, I do believe that he probably psychologically stopped in 81 
and then all of a sudden had a, had that that impulse in 86 for Janelle's case. But at age 41 on, he was able to keep it under control, but he continued to fantasize. And I'm absolutely guaranteeing that because when I walked into his room after he's arrested, he had a towel draped over his computer monitor. And that's exactly what he did when he would separate the women out into their family rooms. He would put a towel or similar object over the TV, turn the TV on so he could get that soft glow so he could see the woman as he's raping them. You know, that leads to another question. Um, let's see whether you have any advice at all to people who find them, unfortunately, would find themselves in this situation or to prepare for that, that someone is going to rape them or kill them, and they're pretty sure that that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we talk about all the people you know, who work, put their lives trying to solve the other cases yep. to stop these people. Is there, is there something they can do, like the fight that Sanchez had against them, which will... I mean, in a way, you could say that he may have um, saved 10 lives no, absolutely. over I, I the think next 10 years. Sanchez the next is probably years. a hero, for sure. Yeah. That, no, so absolutely. so what, would you, what would you suggest to people who are in this terrible situation? Okay, fight. But if that's not working, try going limp. So you have to understand that there's different types of uh, offenders and what their motivations are. And, you know, I'm, I'm very much a big believer in what's called the grape uh, or the gross rapist typologies. And then uh, Dr. Uh, Keppel from, he was one of the detectives on uh, up in Seattle on the Green, Green River Killer. He's the one that, you know, interviewed uh, Ted Bundy. He's now a PhD down at, in Texas. And he's taken these rapist typologies and has written a book, which is available in paperback now, on signature killers. And, you know, your power reassurance, your power assertive, your anger retaliatory. You know, these are guys that are, they're violent, right? But some of them, like the power reassurance, if you fight, they're not really wanting that and they will, they will bug out. Um, and, you, you know, you just kind of do that. But the one typology that you have to watch out for is the sexual sadist because he wants you to fight. He wants you to scream. He wants to make you hurt. These are the guys that like to torture while you're alive. That's what they sexually get gratified off. And there's evidence. In fact, there was a hitchhiker out here who I thought potentially, Phil Hughes, a serial killer mm -hmm. uh, in my book that I talk about, you know, she thought she possibly had been picked up by Phil Hughes. And she was picked up in Berkeley, taken through the Caldecott Tunnel and taken up into the hills of Orinda, which, are, which is now developed, but at the time was not. And as he's raping her, she's realizing I'm dead. You know, and she's looking out the car window and just looking at nature. And she starts stroking the back of this guy's neck, almost like it's a consensual encounter. And this guy immediately pushes up. It's like, mm. and he just goes, get out. And he, he ultimately drove her back to a, a certain location. Um, but that's not what he wanted. He wanted her fear. He wanted her to fight. There's a woman up in the Pacific Northwest who said she was in the, the front seat of a pickup truck and this guy is taking a knife and just carving into her over and over. And she goes, I'm just like dead. And she stopped fighting and just went, I'm just going, I'm dead. And this guy immediately stopped and pushed off. So if you find yourself in this unfortunate situation, you fight, you fight. And if you see this guy just start to really amp up, like he's enjoying that, go opposite for a short period of time and see what happens you might save your life. But if that's not causing him to stop, then you re-engage. The best thing you can do is just keep fighting and just hope that somehow, some way, you're able to get out of that situation. That's my best advice based on what these guys are like. Yeah. And, and the whole advice is you, what their expectations are, you have to frustrate what they want. Yes, no, absolutely, because yeah. these guys are fantasy motivated. Yeah. You know, so if they're not getting what their fantasy is, then it's not doing anything for them. So well, here's someone who wants to work on this. If someone were to look into a cold case as a public citizen, what's the first step you'd recommend? <sighs> oh, um, tell talk about Michelle. Well, I think 
you know, w when you take a look at what Michelle did, you know, she became very knowledgeable about the case up front. Um, and, and that's one of the things where I started to recognize, okay, this is not somebody who's just, just read a bit of information online is talking to me now. You know, there had been a fair amount of research gone into at the time she first contacted me and we had our first discussion. So that's, that is definitely part of it, but you need to develop the skill sets of how to find authentic information. Authentic information is not what's online. You need to go and figure out, uh, is there a, can I do a public records request or a FOIA on an agency at this point? Can I go to the courts and see if there's any unsealed search warrants? Was there a trial per ch you know, by chance? Maybe there is an acquittal and it's still an unsolved case, but there could be huge amounts of information in court documents. So this is where you learn how to find authentic information first and foremost, and then of course, what has been released to the public? You know, going to libraries, microfilm. You know, libraries are a great source when it comes to the archives. And now you have online resources like newspapers.com, et cetera, of course. Um, do a pay attention to what's out there online, but don't put too much weight on that, you know, because that, that's where it's like you need to make sure you're solid with official information on the case. Uh, and then start forming relationships with the, the people uh, that have access, you know, the investigators, um, the family members. I just really try to prevent, I, I, I don't want the, the typical online sleuth, you know, just constantly harassing family members of the victims. You know, that, that's just not cool. You know, but at a certain point, if you get to a certain stage, it may be worth, you know, if you can develop it in a very non-threatening way, a way to contact and, and, and develop that relationship. Because they may see you as their one hope because maybe law enforcement isn't listening. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's fundamental. Um, and then ultimately, you know, in order for these cases to be solved, you know, you have to engage the investigating agency that has jurisdiction. Uh, and that can be done through a variety of ways. But ideally, just like Michelle did with me and others in Golden State Killer, she formed friendly relationships, a helpful relationship. Um, law enforcement views media, the online sluice as a threat. Yeah, and that's something that you have to try to alleviate if you want to have any level of cooperation. And if you can bring something to the table that makes that investigator's life easier, you know, I'll do this for you. Yes, okay, go. You know, I, I had one of the online sleuths, you know, in Golden State Killer. He was, in fact, his mom had, had been a victim. And I say, you know, they're looking at the town hall meetings. I said, why well, no Sacramento, you know, archives? has all the SACB photos. Go see if you can find all the photos of town hall meetings on the East Area Rapist back in the day. And he did. And now I got a copy of, of all those, you know? And then of course he puts those out online for the Reddit people and everybody else to kind of look at, which is fine, you know, but I benefited because now I had something I was interested in, in getting, but I just didn't have the time to sit there and digitize all these photos at, uh, at Sacramento's historical archives. So there's a, a variety of ways. You know, but most certainly uh, private citizens can help. And I think law enforcement, more progressive agencies will uh, be more embracing than, than other agencies. It's, it, it is, it's going to be up to the personal philosophies of the investigators or the police chief or the sheriff. But, you know, all you can do is try with those agencies at least. Well, we have two big questions left. Um, and before I do that, I want to remind everybody that uh, Paul will be signing books uh, right afterwards. Uh, I'd also like to let everybody know that this is a, a good lit event uh, that's uh, underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation here at the Commonwealth Club. Um, and I would like to ask a similar question to this one. The, the question is, beyond genetic genealogy, are there any new scientific techniques on the horizon that will benefit forensic work? And the, the question that I have along that line is, is there a silver lining to our loss of privacy? Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that it's going to end up, you know, helping us, you know, I mean, is, yeah. that, is that part of the trade-off of, of the sure. 21st century? Okay, so related to new technologies, you know, there's, there's always research going on. 
And new technologies may be something that are being pursued with, within forensics, or there are technologies out there within the academic world that have utility with physical evidence that are found in criminal cases. And so that is always, that's always going on. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, know, you know, when we start talking about um, active cases, uh, high tech, that's the, that's the big thing. Everybody's got a personal device on them. There's so much, if you wanna call it like surveillance, you mm -hmm. know, whether it be uh, surveillance cameras that people put up at their house for their own home security, whether it be uh, government cameras that uh, you know, cities uh, are putting up at intersections. Um, uh, there's license plate readers out there. You know, there's a, a lot of technology that really can help with an investigation today. And this is also what helps prevent these types of crimes. You know, mm -hmm. we've seen a dramatic shift from the 1970s where these predators were frequently going into private residence in a, in a, in a neighborhood. There was no home security systems. There was none of the surveillance going on. They could just walk right in or easily break into these houses and spend hours like D'Angelo did today to commit that type of crime over and over again is going to be very tough. Um, but now, you know, of course, the offender is going to try to do something to minimize risk to themselves. And so the, sort of the evolution of the serial predator is using the online resources to lure and isolate victims, you know, the, the Craigslist killers or you know, killers that are, are reaching out to escort services and having these, these uh, uh, workers go out to a location that is not traceable back to that particular offender. Um, so that's really that, that big shift. It's always a cat and mouse game within law enforcement. Okay, so now genetic genealogy. You know, at one point, I was the poster child of the person that violated everybody's privacy rights in the United <laughs> States. So this is where... It's really understanding how this tool works. Um, of course, we have the DNA from the offender, Golden State Killer. We upload it into a genealogy database, and then we get a list of people who share DNA with our offender. But what does that list tell us? All it tells us is how much DNA they share. It's 35 centimorgans, 50 centimorgans, 65 centimorgans. That just tells me, well, this person's on the order of a third cousin from the offender. That's all that just tells me that's the starting data point, And I need to build back a family tree from that person in the database to the great, great grandparent level. Um, at no point as a law enforcement officer, do we have access to the genetic information of the people in the database. If any of you have done these tests and Ancestry.com or MyHeritage, you'll get you know, the, the emails or the list and uh, we're no different than you. It's like, oh, here's so-and-so and you share 50 centimorgans. This is a third cousin. That's all I need to know using this tool. I don't need to know anything more than that. And the technique itself is, is, is really a genealogy technique using public source information. So once I get a list of relatives and I know how closely or distantly related they are, I now build family trees using everything in Ancestry.com or other types of resources like census records, obituaries, newspaper.com, findagrave.com. Mm. Right now, I can take his name, his age, I can identify him online, and within minutes, I'm in Ancestry.com building his family tree. I don't need DNA from him to do that. You know, so it's the, a big one. I have 95 first cousins. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> <laughs> so so don't, don't, don't use music. Yeah. That, that, that would busy. be problematic. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but so this is really a public record search. We just need the starting data points so that we're not, we're not just go striking out. Now, the thing that people don't understand is traditional law enforcement investigations, Golden State Killer. We collected DNA from hundreds of men because their ex-wives, ex-girlfriends said he was a bad dude back in the 1970s and he looked like that composite. Mm. Right, So now that guy's getting a knock on the door from Paul Hole saying, your name has come up in this investigation. It's kind of a serious investigation. Let's chat. And oh, by the way, 
I need a DNA sample. Are you willing to give me a DNA sample? 90% of the time they do. Mm -hmm. So now I, as a peace officer, a representative of the government, possess that man's DNA, right? With the genetic genealogy tool, we got DNA from one person during the entire process. And that was a sister of a guy I was looking at in Colorado. And when that DNA, and it was vol absolutely voluntary, she was very, very friendly to us. When that DNA sample came back, it proved that she was not the sister of the Golden State Killer. So I could eliminate the Colorado guy without ever contacting him and getting his DNA. But she had more DNA shared with the Golden State Killer than anybody in the database. So it told us, ooh, this is working. And remember, this is the first time this is being done. And so all of a sudden, we're stoked. And the last person that we hadn't really looked at was D'Angelo. I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll look at this Auburn cop. You know, mm -hmm. How could he possibly be the Golden State Killer? But the reality is, is that this genealogy tool saved hundreds more men from having their DNA possessed by the government. And we exonerated people as a result of it. So this is where I implore legislators and even the privacy advocates out there who are going, oh my God, we can't have law enforcement accessing these private citizens' genetic information. Learn how this works. It doesn't work the way you think it does. It, oh my God, what people put in their Instagram and Facebook pages <laughs> is so much more intrusive into their private lives than what the, you know, the genealogy databases provide law enforcement. So that's really my fundamental message. I know it's a personal decision. If you want your DNA up there, I'd be more concerned about the private businesses that have access to your DNA than law enforcement having access to your DNA. Take a look at who bought Ancestry and research that and go, uh-oh. Mm -hmm. So just... You know, th this is where this tool has proved revolutionary. We've seen, I, I, I think we're approaching 200 of the worst of the worst cases, cold cases, since Golden State Killer being solved utilizing this tool. And there hasn't been one legitimate claim of somebody's privacy being vi violated or some false arrest as a result. You know, so it is really proving it's, it's, it's being done responsibly. And it's always, you ne we never make an arrest on genealogy. We always get a direct sample like D'Angelo. We got a direct sample from him and he goes, well, he matches Golden State Killer using court validated technology that's been in use for several decades now. So it, it is a really solid tool and has proven itself. All right, so for the last question, everybody wants to know about I mean, you, you get very personal in your book about your anxiety attacks, about the, your wife saying that you're, you, you, she considers your job to be your mistress and that you only pay attention to your mistress and not to, to the family, um, how absorbing it is, um, but also the endlessness of the problems to be solved. Yeah. You know, it's just an endless amount of suffering out there and what one person can do and where do you draw the line so that you can protect your family life and this is true not just for people who are trying to solve serial killers, uh, crimes, but, but all kinds of things in life. How, how do you sure. balance things? I don't do a very good job at that. <laughs> you know, Usually it, it, people who don't have really good advice for others, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so when you think about the types of cases I'm working, you know, I, I talk about this one case out of Hercules, father and son that were executed. The son was 11 years old, um, and he shot in the back of the head and killed. And imagine if that were your child and you call up to talk to the investigator and the, the clerk answering the phone says, oh, he's gone on vacation. You'd be pissed, right? You're expecting more from the people that are trying to keep you safe and trying to get you justice, get you an answer as to what happened. And so that was always something that really was a tough thing for me to be able to balance mm -hmm. is that I've got an obligation to this case you know, and of course, I'm a person. And as the case would age, you know, the amount of time I would spend would be less and less. But then I would all of a sudden amp up again if something else came up. So that's part of, you know, the, the complexities of this type of job. It's not an eight to five job. Mm -hmm. And the people, the victim's families are expecting you to do more. 
um, you, you, it's it's different than than maybe other occupations to where you know once you know the you know the clock goes you know you're, you're you're punching out you know you really are obligated to continue to push forward um, and so that's where it really becomes complicated when of course family is calling mm -hmm. and it's like well I mean how can I say I'm going to go do this you know kind of fun function with my family when I'm trying to you know you know protect the public first and foremost and and, and figure out who killed this person mm -hmm. um, and and I don't have an answer you know I am poor at that there are other people that are better um, but part of the successes that I have had are because of my persistence mm -hmm. um, and and I think any good investigator will tell you that this is where those you have to sacrifice your personal life in order to be good at this job otherwise you're you're just you're you're, you're punching a time time card mm -hmm. and you're not doing what you took an oath to do well first uh, i think everybody appreciates your being persistent um i think solving the golden state cake uh, the golden state killer case was something that i a lot of people felt Finally, we're getting someplace with this technology yeah. that we can, and it gives everyone hope in the future that other things can be solved and that also, as you said, the killers are gonna have to get around this and they're gonna have to be smarter or whatever. Yep. Uh, make, make life more difficult for them. Um, so thank you for your persistence and your, your work for um, in this area. And thank you for coming to the Commonwealth Club and, and telling us all about it. <laughs> and. Uh, I, I, I will be out. I will be back out here to, to sign your books in, in yeah. just a few minutes. Exactly. And, uh, and those of you who are watching online, you know, if you like this program on CommonwealthClub.org, uh, um, you can support us. Uh, but so ends another event of the Commonwealth Club in its 120th year of enlightened discussion. Awesome. Really appreciate it, Paul. No, it, was, it was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. And, and they better keep this bottle of wine out here. You can go and share it. No. <laughs> <laughs>